Uh, today, I am joined by Aaron Bergman. He is the owner of Golffinity, a new kind of golf experience here in Austin, Texas. So, uh, Aaron, I appreciate you taking the time to, to join me. Thank you, Troy. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, I guess to start off, why don't you kind of tell us maybe a little bit about Golffinity? So, um, you know, I think most people, uh, obviously, most people are probably going to have some idea about golf in general. And then, you know, you get the people top or uh, top golf has been here in Austin for a while, but kind of tell us a little bit about your guys' uh, facility and experience. Sure. Yeah. So, um, Golffinity is a first of its kind. We're an indoor golf performance club. So, we're a 20,000 square foot facility with 20 hitting bays where golfers can come to take lessons, really just discover the game and, and, and kind of find their interest in the game, as well as uh, develop it through group instruction, private instruction. We have a lot of different technology resources to really help golfers take their game to the next level. Um, all of our, all of our um, hitting bays are simulated. We have 20 total. It's a 20,000 square foot facility, so in two stories, so pretty big, pretty big facility. But yeah, it's a first of its kind concept. Uh, it's membership based, so really not only are we trying to help golfers uh, reach their um, their potential and enjoy the game more, but we're also building a community. So um, lots of um, lots of opportunities to network and to really just uh, build their their golf community uh, around the game so yeah it's uh we've been open for just a few weeks now and it's been a blast and and great to see such a positive reception from the community that's awesome uh so kind of giving me a little bit about your background um you know what's your origin story what kind of got you into golf what kind of got you into trying to start a business like this um kind of what you know most people aren't originally from Austin It's kind of one of the good things and or bad things about Austin, but mo mostly good, but uh, kind of give us a little bit about your background and origin story. Sure. Yes. Like most people in Austin, I too am not from this area. I never envisioned that I would be living in Texas. I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest, Tacoma, Washington. And my background is in, is in coaching. I'm a PGA golf professional and from, I guess, probably, I was maybe in high school, you know, I really identified my, my path as teaching and coaching. I'm the son of a school principal. So really grew up in that education world and have worked uh, solely in golf since I was 16 years old. And I had some very unique experiences within the industry. Um, I went and spent three years uh, teaching throughout Asia and and really just got opened up to uh, just meeting amazing people sort of by way of golf um, and, and had these sort of non-traditional experiences that really opened up my eyes to what the possibilities, you know, within the industry and within the game could be. And in 2008, I moved to New York from Asia and got back into a very traditional golf industry role, working at uh, a very prestigious country club, a beautiful place in Westchester County, New York. And after being there for a few seasons, I recognized that, you know, I didn't, I didn't see my career path as being under this very sort of narrow umbrella of, um, of working at one facility and, and, and teaching you know, the same sort of legacy golfers that were members at the facility. And, and I really just had this deep desire to expand, just expand my horizons similarly to what I had done overseas. And I had worked a lot in youth programming while in the kingdom of Bhutan, also Nepal and, and quite a bit in Thailand, and really just started to yearn to have more of a community connection to what I was doing. And so with that background in, in, uh, in youth coaching and my, you know, just sort of my comfort level in working with, um, with schools, I decided, okay, let me, let me start a program that deals with bringing the golf to the community and let me work directly with schools. 
And so I came to Austin, Texas, this is 2010, and started a program called Golf in Schools. And the idea was we would make golf an after-school enrichment program and bring golf directly to the schools and just make trying golf out a much easier decision. Because <clears throat> here's what I here's what I started to recognize as I was becoming a golf professional, working in the industry is, you know, here golf had enriched my life so much. I had been all over the world. I was earning a paycheck, you know, by way of the game and, and working in my passion. And the fact that I even was introduced to golf, you know, was just by chance because I lived so close to a, a public golf course growing up. My parents weren't golfers. And I realized like, you know, had I have not lived a mile away from this golf course that had great youth programming, I mean, there's no way that I would have traveled the world, you know, with my, my golf clubs towed, towed it on my back. And so that really inspired, um, this desire to say, Hey, you know, people can benefit from the game in these amazing ways. And maybe not exactly the way that I am, but certainly golf can enrich people's lives. But what are the, what is the, what is the likelihood that, that people who don't live a mile away from a public golf course are going to pursue the game. And so that was really the inspiration behind this after school program is we'll bring golf to the people. And so I came to Austin, Texas. I started it in four or five schools and it ended up being a, a, an amazing thing. At, at one point we grew to about a hundred schools in central Texas and had about 2000 kids going through the program every year. And it was very challenging operationally, but just such a joy to do and to see so many people who, you know, you'd hear the parents say like, wow, my, my, my kid loves golf. We, we would have never known. We, we would have never thought to have them even try any programming. And so, you know, that was, that was a really neat thing to be a part of um, and to be connected in the community in that way. And after doing that for four or five years, you know, we sort of realized that we were introducing people to golf, families to golf who, who otherwise, you know, would not have thought to pursue the game. But then once we were introducing them and getting them excited about it, they had, they had nowhere to go. You know, they, they were relying on us. Well, where, where can we go get lessons and where can, where should we buy equipment and what golf course should we go to? And we didn't really have any way to continue serving them down their path. And so that was when we said, Hey, we really need to have our own school. So working in the traditional uh, industry and the experience I'd had previously, okay, okay, we'll go to a golf course and we'll, we'll get a golf course to open a school or allow us to open a school and we can take our, our students from the after school program to the golf course and they can continue down this traditional path of becoming a golfer and, and really um, engaging in the culture of the sport. And so I went to several golf courses that were right in the hotbed of where our after school program was and said, Hey, I'd, I'd love to take all of these students from these elementary schools and, and really funnel them into your golf course. And what I would ask is some access to, the facility to be able to do some lessons and some clinics, et cetera. And Troy, I couldn't get a golf course to uh, buy into the idea, which was very disappointing at the time, but ended up being uh, sort of the catalyst to create this alternative um, type of facility. So because I couldn't get a golf course to, to come on board, I, I found a gym who was willing to sublet a little bit of space in their back corner for me to build a few bays and to start teaching lessons. And so that's exactly what we did. We just opened a little two bay facility and started to bring kids from the after school program to our school. And, you know, very organically, cause it was all bootstrapped. We, we didn't, we didn't, you know, have proper funding by any means and just very organically started building the program uh, to the point where we said, Whoa, this is, this is pretty special what we're creating here. Um, you know, what is the real vision and golfinity is, is really the culmination of, of what that true vision is. So it's been honestly uh, a 12 year journey to get to this point. So you can imagine opening the facility up just a few weeks ago, uh, what a feeling it has been for our team, because like I said, it's been many years in the making. Sure. Yeah. No, uh, probably challenging to when you couldn't get the golf courses to buy into it, to, 
be like, oh, I'm, let me just go buy a golf course and then I can do it myself. Like, that's not really an option to, to, to do, unfortunately, uh, on your own that way. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I think in general, the barriers to get into a lot of sports have gotten harder than when you and I were kids. You know, like when you would just kind of go out and be able to randomly get together with your friends and play baseball or football or basketball, where now it seems like most stuff almost has to be organized, which provides some, you know, some cost entry that almost wasn't there 20, 30 years ago. But then golf especially has ge definitely generally higher barriers to entry in trying to, you know, the, the equipment that's required for it, the, like say, getting onto golf courses or finding places to, to actually play the game does make it more challenging, which is, you know, again, like you mentioned, unfortunate because it is a great game and is, you know, people that get the chance to play it usually find a lot of joy and a lot of frustration when they, when they play it though. You're, you're right. The, the, the entry barriers to golf are extremely high. And then the other thing is you mentioned, you know, when, like when we were kids getting into sports or activities, it was a lot easier, but also there were way less options. So now if you're a family trying to make the decision, you know, there's only so many activities you as a family or your kids can do the choices that parents have now. I mean, they're endless. And so golf is really competing against that. It's just, and so many of those, those choices and those activities are so engaging and, and include uh, technology, which is, you know, very appealing to kids. And that's what golf's competing against. It's like this really exciting, fun game on an iPad. And, and that's, you know, that's a hard sell. Hey, Hey, nine-year-old, do you want to go to this driving range? It's really hot out. And, you know, you don't earn any points and you don't get to kill any monsters, you know, and you're not going to be very good at it for, for potentially a long time. Would you rather do that or or go play this video game or this indoor activity? And it's just a tough sell. And, and honestly, that's it's one of the beautiful things of our concept that we never thought about initially, which is that because we are fully indoors, um, and for several reasons, it, it attracts a whole different demographic that if we were only outdoors, mm -hmm. we might not otherwise capture. For example, if you're a mom who's deciding, okay, I'm going to take my, my child to this activity on a weekly basis, you know, you, you not only are you taking into consideration the activity that you're choosing, but also what's the experience going to be like for the mom or potentially the sibling who's not participating, but where are they going to go while they wait for an hour while your son or daughter is taking a lesson? And if we're outdoors, you know, are they going to sit in the car for an hour? I mean, that's, that's a tough sell as a parent. I mean, I'd much rather go watch my child do something in a space where it's air conditioned and comfortable. And so, you know, we just started to notice like, oh, wow, this whole different segment of person who otherwise wouldn't have even wanted to do golf or wouldn't have gone down that path is doing it because we are indoors and offering this comfortable sort of inviting space and environment. Yeah, that well, that and as well, like say you can obviously most lessons, even back if you were doing it outdoors or back in the day when you were probably doing, most lessons are going to be kind of that hour in length and stuff. But the other challenge golf wise is just the time commitment to go play, right? Like most people want to go play around. And um, again, when I grew up, I would often go like you could go play nine holes where it doesn't seem like people really do nine holes anymore, especially if you're not, not a member of a country club where it's like, oh, well, you're just playing whatever round you want. Like almost all, all clubs nowadays, if it's a public course, well, here's your rate for 18 holes unless you do like a twilight rate and stuff. And so then you're like, well, shoot, do I want to commit five hours of my day to that, um, which can be challenging for a, a kid, like you say, especially if you have other activities going on or a shorter attention span when you're nine or 10 years old. Like, I don't know that I can do golf for, for five hours and go play 18 holes, but for 30 minutes for an hour of actually hitting balls into a bay and kind of having some of that immediate feedback uh, is a easier commitment in a lot of cases. Yeah. You're spot on with that. I mean, it's a huge time commitment to play around a golf and for someone who let's say, in the golf spectrum, one end of, of participating in the sport is 
in the traditional sense, playing 18 holes, you book a tee time, you go to a golf course, you bring your own clubs, you rent the cart, you do all of that. Like we'll say that that's at the far end of the spectrum of, of once you're immersed and you, you identify as a golfer and you're partic participating in the sport. On the other end of the spectrum, the very light end of the spectrum is something like top golf. So it's very easy. It doesn't take that much time. It's, it's very lighthearted. It doesn't require, you, you don't need to a have very much skill or even know much about the game. You know, if someone goes to the golf course for the first time and they've never done it. It's a very intimidating thing. You know, where do you check in and how does it work? You know, it's, it's, it's a lot. So mm -hmm. top golf is at this other end of the spectrum. It's very easy. So let's say you go to Top Golf and you say, "Wow, that was really fun! You know, we took some swings, we earned some points in a game, we had some food and some drinks. This golf thing, I think I might like that. I think I might might want to continue." Well, it's a lot to ask of someone to make the jump from Top Golf to let's book a tee time at an 18-hole golf course. Yeah. So, in between that is this massive chasm, this Grand Canyon Delta of you know, what does the person do to continue on this path and take these steps? And, and honestly, th that is, is where we feel very privileged to sort of fit in the middle to go, let me, let me grab the people who are curious and let me give them this pathway because our facility is indoors, but we're not saying that we're a replacement to outdoor golf. You know, we're saying, Hey, you can train, you, you can train your skill, develop your confidence, find other people to to participate in the game with. And then outside of our facility, go have these very traditional green grass experiences, because honestly, there's no nothing I would rather do if, I, if I'm going to do something that's golf related. If I have the time, I want to be on a golf course on a nice, you know, beautiful, sunny day doing that. But you know, I don't have the opportunity to do that all the time. So what's going to fill those holes in between? Sure. And generally, you want to do that on a nice sunny day in the Pacific Northwest where it's 75 degrees out instead of 105 degrees out. Well, <laughs> this the, the fact that we opened our facility, we opened our facility, I think, on a day that it was about 105. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of fitting. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot to ask. It's, it's a, even even kids in summer camps, you say, oh, we're, you know, you want to do a fun golf summer camp and you're going to go spend four hours in the heat. I mean, that's just, that's a tough thing to do. I mean, even people who love golf more than anything, mm -hmm. who, who play golf all the time, you know, doing it when it's extremely hot out. I mean, they're saying, okay, I've, <laughs> I've reached my limit. Like yeah. I'm now past the threshold of when I can do this because of what the weather conditions are. And, you know, those people still need a place to get their swings in. So we're happy that uh, we're, we're happy that we're not dependent on, uh, the weather conditions. Yeah. Well, the other thing that'll be interesting. So, um, so I, I didn't start playing golf until I was in high school and, you know, and played, a, you know, a little, a little bit through high school and then have played occasionally since then. But like when I first, I've been down in Texas now for almost 17 years. And I remember thinking, well, oh, it's a lot warmer down in Texas. So I'll be able to potentially play golf year round, which will be kind of cool. And it didn't really dawn on me that like, well, yeah, it's warmer in the winter months. But if you have a regular nine to five job, by the time you get done with that job, it's still dark out. And so you can't necessarily, you know, if you have a regular office job, um, you can't necessarily go to your office job and then go play the twilight rates because it's already dark out. And so it'll be interesting to see if that um, is another way to, for people to kind of get into your facility uh, in the late fall, winter months that way, just because, you know, obviously we have some pretty bad weather where you wouldn't want to play either, but also just because they can do it after work when you normally couldn't go to the golf golf course or driving range, uh, typically because it's just dark out. Yeah. It's what's so exciting about the space in, in, in this sort of, I call it this, this pioneer space in golf, which is this, these indoor facilities, golf technology is moving very quickly, very rapidly, and it's fun to be a part of it. And, and really what it's doing is it's just, it's opening the doors for, for how and when people can participate in a golf activity. So 
you know, we've already talked a little bit about the time, but if I go indoors and, and play around a golf on a simulator and I can play 18 holes in an hour instead of four and a half. And then the time of day, as you said, you know, summer, it's too hot. Winter time, it gets dark too early. And, you know, we'll, we're open till 10. So you don't have to worry about that. And that's what um, I think is really needed in golf is just a way to to broaden the, the, the net that is cast out for ways in which people can can really just participate in the sport. And and again, and, and I'm always clear with people is in no way would I ever want like simulated golf to be a replacement for golf because it could never be. I mean, it isn't that for me. But because golf, the conditions have to be, you know, you have to have budget enough time. You have to do it at the right time of day. Because of those things, someone like me, who there's really no other activity I would rather do outside of, you know, my my work life, family life. If I'm going to go do something as a hobby, like nothing is going to is going to be above golf for me. And so someone who loves golf, you know, almost more than anything, I still only do it, you know, maybe once a month because Mm -hmm. I have a busy job. I have a family with two young sons and, you know, I have a two and a half year old, like a golf course is not a great place to take him. (laughs) Right. That's a stressful environment. So as a result, you know, I don't do it very often. So finding time to fit it in is difficult for me. And I, it is for most people, I think. No, for sure. Uh, How do you think, uh, or have you guys looked much into how virtual reality might impact the business down the road, right? Like it's definitely not, I mean, Virtuality is here, but it's not really a mass adoption kind of thing. But it does feel like for something like a golf simulator situation that it could potentially um, carve its way into that, you know, line of of, um, entertainment or practice, maybe more than than some other ones. Um, Is that have is it something that you guys either look into to kind of expand the business down the road or how it might impact it, your guys um, as it starts to get more mass adoption? Yeah. So one of our, you know, really one of the tenets of our business is to be this, this, this technology forward facility and, and not so that we have all the bells and whistles. It's so you know that we can provide the, the greatest training environment and provide Technology in golf, you know, there's a lot of it that's coming that, that, that's coming into the marketplace. And, you know, for us, it's okay. Is this going to uh, enhance the experience of our members, either from an entertainment standpoint, but most importantly, from a training and development standpoint? And, you know, right now we have some pretty cutting edge stuff and we want to continue to do that. And that's part of my challenge is, hey, what's out there? You know, what are the technologies that are that are out there that are coming on and and vetting those and and determining, is this really going to be something that my members can benefit from and um, and just help them enjoy their their path and their journey in the game of golf? VR is interesting. You know, I haven't uh, I haven't there's a few VR programs for golf and I have not really spent much time um trying them i have certainly kind of been watching from a distance but i have no doubt that it will become mainstream eventually if you just see where vr is going in general Mm -hmm. and i do see where and i've read about it where there are you know some potential applications to to help golfers um imagine you know if you're going to plan a tournament and you have this opportunity to sort of go and map out the course through virtual reality 3D, I mean, you can already go and play a golf course. We have students, you know, even collegiate players who, or or or, or golfers who are going on a, a a buddies trip, you know, to let's say Whistling Straits, and then they can come in and play that golf course before that they go to their their trip. And now, you know, they have a better experience when they go do that trip because they're they have in some way have familiarized themselves with the course. Well, you can imagine from a VR standpoint, you could how much more immersive and, and familiar you could become through that type of application. So, yeah, I think all that stuff is is fascinating, and um, it will be interesting to see. It, it, it's moving very quickly, 
and the technology is is improving um, every day. And um, yeah, we, we we can't we can't wait to see what's next. That's for sure. Yeah, no, it's they like say it's one of those where you know there are going to be advancements. It's just kind of how it eventually ends up kind of looking uh, down the road. And like you say, yeah, the the being able to, I mean, even I can even remember playing like to one of Tiger Woods' old video games and like being like, well, shoot, if I went to Pebble Beach or St. Andrews, like obviously you see those on TV as well too, so that helps. But like you'd be like, oh, well, I would have a better idea of what to expect from the course. Whereas when you go to a course you've never been to before, you're kind of like, well, I think this is the best way to play the whole, but I don't really know what the, how the fairway undulates or how different thing, you know, if there's something hidden that I'm, I can't really see um, that could be trouble that way. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like, we'll see. Oh, good. No, I was I was just going to say that uh, we'll we'll see what happens uh, in the technology space. But you know, one comment I I, I might make, Troy, um, it's very interesting with with golf simulation that before it was a very small niche market because of the the credibility of the data, the the hardware that's tracking the ball you know, was not reliable. And so now it's gotten to a place where it is incredible that if I hit a shot on a simulator, I trust that I can trust and, and not just myself, but you know, the top, the top players in the world, they can trust that whatever that is showing up on the screen, that that's basically what it would be if I was just hitting it on the driving range in real life, you know, so you say, okay, now, They've gotten past that threshold where what I'm seeing indoors and what's what's being tracked is accurate. So now, really, the next kind of forefront is, all right, all the hardware is good enough. It's accurate enough. And there's so many systems out there, and I've, I've probably tested mo most of them. And they're honestly all pretty accurate. You know, some people claim one is better than the other, but we've stacked them all on top of each other and they're pretty much putting out the same data and the same numbers and simulating the same flight. But f the next wave and where you're seeing it move even faster is, is now through the software experience. And it's how immersive can I make it? How in depth can I make a Bay experience and, and, and the graphics of St. Andrews on the course when I go and how realistic can they make it look? And you mentioned Tiger Woods, you know, video game, video game graphics are incredible. Mm -hmm. And if you compare video game graphics to your average simulated course on the screen, I mean, it doesn't even compare. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of money to be made in video games. And prior to really just the last four or five years, there wasn't much money to be made in, in golf simulated sure. technology. So as a result, like it was not developed very much. Well, now that's changing. And so you're seeing the software change and improve very rapidly. It hasn't caught up to traditional video games, but I believe that it will. And whether it's, you know, the software from, from the simulation or VR, I think it's going to be very cutting edge sooner than later. Yeah. Very nice. Um, so you mentioned obviously like the, the kind of the Genesis, behind starting the golf entity was kind of that kids program but like what what are like what's kind of the typical member that you member or, or patron into the facility at this point is it still mostly kind of that juniors program or are you seeing kind of a split between juniors and adults and and what's the kind of goal that way for the facility not that you're not going to take anybody but you know, is it geared more one towards the other? It's not geared more towards one or the other. You know, there's so many different people who can enjoy the game of golf. Um, we try to be a very family oriented facility. So <clears throat> about 60% of our membership is a family membership. So adults and kids utilizing the facility. Last month, I think we did 800 lessons and about half of those are junior lessons, so very robust junior program, and love that we are are uh, catering to and 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 bringing on the next generation of golfers to inspire them to to have passion and want to pursue the game for what hopefully will be their lifetime. 
but because we have so much incredible technology and and really the, the efficiency of training it's so funny i was having a conversation with a member um yesterday about when i was a kid trying i desperately just wanted to be good at golf i mean i would have given anything to be good at the game and i worked so hard at it and looking back knowing what i know and looking at the data and and instantly you can diagnose like why a ball is curving one way versus the other the metrics that are at your disposal on every single shot is like it's more than you could ever need or or wish for compared to when i was 15 years old you know i was so inefficient in my training and i really didn't know anything and nobody did I mean, people teaching it was the, nobody was working in absolutes it was just a lot of, you know, let's try this, let's try that and hope it makes you better. And so because now we can be so efficient with how we train and, and so accurate with the data that we're putting out on each training session, you know, we're also this is incredible place for very um, talented, high level players, you know, zero handicaps. We have touring professionals who are practicing in our facility. You know, on a weekly basis, we have a PGA Tour ambassador, Dylan Fratelli, who lives in Austin, and just, you know, played extremely well at the Open Championship a few weeks back. And he's coming into our facility to use some of our technology to improve his game. And I think that's one of the things that I love about it the most. And that's what I love about golf just in general is that golf is not just for the high level player it's for everybody, regardless of your skill level. And to be a facility that really can house, people can house their relationship with the game, regardless of their age, regardless of how long they've been playing, regardless of where they're trying to take their game or how, you know, some people come in and they wanna be very competitive and that's great. But some people just wanna have a fun hobby to do with their friends and, and that should be valued to the same degree. And, I think that's what I love about golf so much is that it can serve you up in so many broad and amazing ways. And we really just want to be a place that whatever lane you or pathway you find the game to, to really cater to you and to serve you up and to enrich your life, you know, we want to provide that pathway for you to pursue it and, and sort of live that. So yeah, we'll see. Um, it's been a fun journey so far. Yeah. And it's also a really fun game because it, it is really you versus you, right? So like in most sports, not that, you know, you aren't kind of tracking how you're doing, but by having that, you know, if you're playing basketball or baseball, by having a specific opponent that kind of affects your outcome, um, it can be harder sometimes to evaluate if you're getting better based on, you know, the opponent level and things of that nature as well. We're in golf. Um, it's very much a you versus you situation. And are you improving on uh, hitting greens and regulation or, you know, your putting or whatever your kind of weakness uh, may be. And then on top of it, it's, it, again, it's a game that at the same time is impossible to master. I mean, even the greatest players generally have bad rounds, bad tournaments. But at the same point in time, it feels like whenever you're having a particularly bad round, you end up hitting one or two shots that make you realize what you love about the game and why you want to continue playing it and just hopefully hit all those great shots in one round somehow. I call it the one in 10 rule. You know, as long as I hit as, as long as I hit one good shot, decent shot every 10 swings, then, you know, it's, it's still will we'll keep my interest to want to keep chasing it. But it is it is the most challenging game. It cannot be perfected. And I think because of that, I think that's why people are they, they become so passionate. I mean, dare I say addicted to the game, but, you know, to non golfers who know like a passionate golfer, they're like, what is it about golf? that makes you so crazy about it. And what I feel is that you, you understand once you start playing it, how challenging it is. So that when you do have these moments of success, it, the weight of those feels so great because you, you, you inherently understand that, you know, it's not dumb luck, you know, to go have a decent round of golf. Like 
And it's so rewarding to feel, wow, I know this game is so hard. And today, you know, I had a good stretch of holes or a good round or whatever it is. The appreciation for that is so much deeper than, you know, if you go have a, a good a good game at checkers. It's like, well, what does that matter? It's an easy game. So I, th- I think that's, even though it's it can drive you crazy, it's also what also what makes it you know, very uh, almost addicting. Sure. No, it, it definitely definitely has those char- characteristics for sure. So, um, for people that are interested in learning kind of more about you guys, what are kind of the best ways to um, get in touch and or learn more? Sure. So you can go to www.golfinity.com. Come to our website. Um, check out some of our programming. We're located right uh, right off of 620 and 183 in North Austin. We're a big facility. You can't miss us from the road. So, you know, we're we're open to everyone. And so I would encourage if you're if you're in the area, pop by. We have incredible staff. And, you know, we 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 really um, we just pride ourselves on being such an inviting space. And, and we're so grateful that when people come in and and maybe have never tried golf before and they're not really sure how to get started and they're a little bit nervous or intimidated that they'll feel that once they walk into our facility that they're welcome and um you know, that, that they'll leave there feeling like hey maybe this is for me too so yeah you can you can find us on the website come into our facility you can find us on instagram uh our handle is at golfinity and check us out and 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 come see what we're all about Cool. Yeah, like you say, I mean, at the at the country club level, it can sometimes feel like an exclusive uh, sport, but it really is uh, relatively inclusive. And so a, sp- a space like yours is a great place to feel that inclusivity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, golf's for everyone. And um, certainly we're trying our best to live that out. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to jump on the podcast today and uh, and just kind of talk about your your as a journey because I think, like I said, I, I do think it's going to be good for Austin and good for golfers. Yeah, thank you, Troy. Well, it's been a pleasure. I, I enjoyed spending this time, and thank you very much for having me on and, and letting me have this discussion and um, and giving me a chance to talk a little bit about our new venture. So, thanks again.